Hi, right, well, I'm to come back to section two of this uh, Bose Solo TV soundbar system repair. Uh, it's Bose. Can you see that? You can't see that, can you? But uh, look, it says uh, buy once, scrap early, or bought once, scrapped early, or any other acronym you can think of. Any other interesting ones? Someone said buy other stereo equipment, which is a bit unkind. It's lovely while it's working. Yeah, that should be their thing, shouldn't it? Say like Bose. It's lovely when it works. And then small brackets underneath. Make the most of it. Um, yeah, so looking at the circuitry, I've just been poking about a bit actually. <clears throat> you, if you haven't seen part one of this video, then you're not going to be able to make any sense of this at all. Where we went through the firmware upgrade and we just watched it crashing and piddled around with it and uh, decided it wasn't the firmware that needed upgrading, it was a complete new um, approach was required. Okay, so anyway, so the, the two things that um, alarm me. In my other video, I pointed out the fact there wasn't very much in this. There's a couple of amplifiers, okay, and some power supplies, but none of these are rocket science. You've got your DSP and some codec chips. Reset circuitry around here and some non-volatile flash and two crystals, okay? Now, of course, the electrolytic capacitors could be gone and, you know, had it been manufactured earlier, I'd say, yeah, it could be, any of these electrolytics could be absolutely suspect and you know, they go to zero, but this is from an era, I think, where they kind of sorted the, the capacitor plague that happened when the uh, ingredients were stolen by the Chinese and they didn't steal them correctly. Um, so, yeah, the things about this, they've got processor, if that's faulty we can't do much about it, okay. If the firmware is corrupted, again you've got a problem, okay. If the flash is not being read correctly or reliably, then, you know, you're not going to get reliable operation, obviously. And that is a worry. And it's annoying that actually Bose, you download, um, what we did, we put the memory chip in, having reflected upon it since we did part one of this video, just, <laughs> you know, Bose, so all right, here's the firmware, reload the firmware. You know, if there's any corrupted flash bits in here, there's no indication that this has done, when you put the stick in to do the, this is what I am, this is what I've got, this is how many turn-ons I've had, there's no checksum for the flash, okay? So if you've got a corrupted flash, you'd quite like to be able to reload the firmware anyway, just in case it was a flash location that lost its data, okay? But you can't do it, they won't let you do it. They say, oh no, it's correct. And I don't know whether a, a, a sum check was done on the firmware and whether it, it checks the actual sum check, the actual uh, CRC check to make sure that the firmware is very high confidence. If the CRC cyclic redundancy check works, then um, it comes up with the right number. Then you've got 99.99% .99 confidence, at least, depending on which algorithm they use, that the flash is intact. Okay. So it's a real shame that you just can't reload the firmware and say, this is your model, here are, here's a firmware, stick it in. I don't see why, just because it thinks it's got the right firmware in, it knows that the firmware is intact, that's in there, okay? Every single bit is reading the right value. Whether they check that or not, I don't know. But if they don't, it's a real shame. So can't I just reload the firmware? No, I can't, because it says I've already got the latest version, but whether the version is actually bit for bit correct is something we don't know at this stage so we are poking around a bit in the dark okay we've got power supplies there seems to be one two three three buck regulators running off the 24 volt supply 23.8 where it is uh, reset chip reset management chip and so as I said there's a few things that shout shout out at me um, as possible potential problems Firstly, um, we've got an AKM5388 floor chip there. See that one? That's a uh, A to D codec chip, and they are not good. They are unreliable, and I have changed probably upwards of a thousand of those in my time. Um, so, yeah, they're not cheap either. They're hard to get hold of, but that one there, AKM5384, is an issue. Um, very hard to get hold of but I do have them in stock this one is another codec chip which is much more widely available you can buy that virtually from CPC or Farnell or DigiKey or wherever you want 
Flash chip, well, unlikely to be writing to Flash when it's playing music, to be honest, isn't it? Don't know what that's for. And then the piece de resistance is they've not got one crystal, but two crystals. And the clock design and the clock, um, well, the design of the clock and the balancing of the, the capacitors for the clock oscillators is one thing. You can see there's a little tiny cap there, it's probably related to the capacitance loading for the clock signals. It used to be a real problem in the old sort of discrete logic days when someone would implement a clock generator from a, a gate and they were very unstable and we've got two crystals here 26 megahertz and 24.57 megahertz crystals and what we're going to do is just check that they are stable okay first and that they're not easily upset because they are prime suspects at this point, okay? Because there's not much in here, as I said before, there isn't much in here to go wrong, all right? So, supply voltage look okay. We'll scope, I'll scope those out to make sure they're all stable and they're doing what they should do. Then we'll check the startup chip to make sure the delay is correct. And then we'll look at these crystals as well to make sure that they are stable. So, the next stage is going to be, I think, probably in orders of probability of what's causing the problem, the first thing I'm going to check are the crystals. So stand by, let's check the crystals. Okay, so here we are. Um, what have we got? We've got the scope up there. And uh, what else have we got? Yeah, we've got the scope probe. Here we are. So let's have a quick shuffle. Just look at the clock frequencies. Let's read the clock signals. It's turned on now. So let's just see what we have. So this is the 26 megahertz crystal. Fairly sinusoidal, isn't it? Let's just uh, let's speed that up a bit. You can have a look. The frequency is 26.0, and it's hovering a bit, but it would do that anyway. If I put the bandwidth limit on, 20 megabits bandwidth, it will affect the waveform, but it will filter some of the noise out, perhaps. No, it won't. But you know, you can't expect the, the scope to. Um, be that great. If we go into the trigger menu in the menu for trigger, so is there a, a setting button? Noise rejection is on, so I've got noise rejection. Hold off 16 nanoseconds, okay. So, yeah, I mean, it's what it is. It's a cheap scope, okay. If I want to get the Tektronix out, we'd have a really good look, but I've got HP um, counter timer, which is fiendishly accurate, which we could use. But just generally, the amplitude is about one and a half volts. It's reasonable for a crystal. And it's quite sinusoidal. And what you can do is just to see how determined to oscillate it is by just, I've got a scalpel in my hand. And if I just touch one end of the crystal, I'm not connected to anything. I'm sitting on an insulated chair. If I just put the capacitance of my body on there, you can see the main sum. But she is determined to oscillate, isn't she? She's not easily upset. She's still chewing away at the same frequency with the main super in her and all the capacitance loading of me on there. So, I mean, that's a pretty determined to oscillate at 26 megahertz, that one, okay? So, to me, unless there's some sort of perturbation going on there, I'd be happy with that one. So, let's have a look at the other one. Let's see what we've got. Oh, now, now look at that. That is much more ragged. Anyone that's done any waveform analysis will know that a any waveform is made up with of a number of harmonics. And a triangular wave is all the even harmonics all summed together, and a square wave is all the odd harmonics. And that looks to me like that's got some other mode it wants to be in. Can you see that? I can't tell about the stability of it. It looks to be the right frequency, but it looks pretty horrible. Let's just check the other side. Right, so the other side is much more sinusoidal look, and we've got about a volt. We've got slightly less amplitude on the on the actual signal we're looking for. And of course it depends on the drive circuit. This might be a factor of the ugliness of the drive circuit. But if I was designing a product and I saw that on the clock, that would ring alarm bells because there's other harmonics in there. that It wants to be going twice the frequency. Can you see the dip in the halfway through the waveform? Yeah, I mean that looks pretty stable to me. It's also quite interesting that it's driving such an ugly waveform at one side and um, a reasonable sine wave at the other. I think this one's got a nice sine wave on both sides. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, if I just designed a micro, I mean, I've done quite a few microprocessor products and things with clocks in and synthesizers, and I would be thinking, I don't like the look of that. <laughs> so, um, what I need to do now is just to make sure I can still induce the problem and see whether it, this fixes it or not. So let's put a waveform into this unit. Let's power up the signal generator. Talks amongst yourselves. Right, so here we've got the counter timer. You can see that up there. And uh, where are we? Let's see what frequency we're getting out of this crystal. That looks pretty stable, doesn't it? 25.57. Yeah, so she's on. She's on target. That one, and all well and good. Let's try the other one. Ah, dear, oh dear, it's, it's one point four hertz out. <laughs> I think they're ten ppm meters uh, crystal. So yeah, ten parts per million. Um, yeah, so they're going at the right speed, but obviously the frequency is important as anything else. And let's just see what happens if we um, put a perturbation on this one. Okay, that one's gone haywire at that point. Let's try this one. As does that one as well, so not a fair test really. But she comes back, that's the main thing. Yeah, so the crystals are spot on frequency wise, so that may not be the issue. So let's just try um, putting some sound, some audio through it and see what happens with, uh, with regard to the codecs themselves. Okay, so we've got uh, signal generator. Rotor Schwartz connected to the uh, right hand channel input. We're pulling out 1 millivolts at the moment at 400 hertz. I was wondering whether it's the right or left channel because sometimes when you drive through the output codec, one channel's fine, the other one causes it to crash. So let's just try that 400 hertz. So I'm going to up, up the signal to 500 millivolts and I'll let it run. I'm not going to make you <laughs> sit through this, <laughs> but uh, I'm just going to make a cup of tea and see whether that channel fails and then I'm going to swap change for the other channel. So it's stable, so I'm trying the right channel now just to make sure. It's funny, when you put music through it, it crashes after a few minutes, but since I've been poking around with those crystals, it seems more stable. I wonder if that's an indication of what might have been the problem. Yeah, it's interesting. So, I'll just turn that off. You can hear it's crashed again. And I can play um, audio signals from the signal generator through the uh, unit fine each channel independently but as soon as I put some music on fairly low volume actually proper music through from Spotify um, actually it's a thought I have to be careful of a copyright strike won't I if I play anything that's recognizable the, in the internet is scanning for so I'm gonna have to put something on which is license free I yeah so points towards the codec or the processor at the moment more poking around and I'll come back to you with some more conclusions. Ah, so here are the crystals. Direct from the supplier. About 40 pence each. Okay, so let's check it over there. What have we got? We've got that one. Don't want that one. Uh, there you go, one of those. Got it. That's a 26 meg one, that's the one, that one there. And we've got this one. There's part number for that one. 18 peak farad loading. Right, so let's whack the crystal in and see what happens, see whether we get an improvement or not. Right, let's just stick a bit of the old jollop on there. Where is it gone? Where's my flux gone? Get rid of this nasty leaded, unleaded solder. This nasty high melting point stuff. Just mop it up with the old solder braid. So we don't like that much, do we, boys? No, we don't. Give it a quick mopping. There we are. Not burning my scope lead in the process. 
on a time deadline on this job. I've got other things to do rather than save the planet. That's interesting, isn't it? Put a bit of that on there. And we'll just tack that one on. These tweezers where you can't let go. <laughs> Let's just open her legs a little bit. That's it, give her a bit of, of exercise. Right, here we go. So. bit there. Perhaps a little shade more. That's it. And then we'll just touch her up on the other side. Give her legs a bit of the old treatment and move her away. Right, so she's in. I'll clean her up later with some isopropyl jobby wang just to see what happens now. Take that off there. Power on. Right, sit rep. I don't know if you can hear me above this round, but it's a much more stable with that crystal done. Much more stable. I can turn, it plays at fairly loud volumes with no trouble at all. But as soon as you hit the remote control now, which it wasn't doing before, when I do this, Goes straight into the old buzzy mode. Let's just turn that off. Ah, oh, that's a relief. Yeah, so it's playing at loud volume and it's much more stable than it was just by changing that crystal, but it's still not running correctly. If we just looked on the, uh, what should we do? Well, um, have I got there? The AKM5381 is taking the, the audio input signal from the uh, AUX in. The AKM5, the uh, Ashai Kasai chip and uh, should we go through it or not? I don't know. Um, I haven't really got time to be honest, but the clock is the master clock is working, the 48 kilohertz uh, clock for the data out is working, and you can see the serial data coming out of it. And on the reference pin, there's a 2.5 volt reference pin, which is a good indication that the circuit is working is correct, which is half of VCC, okay probe those but if you're getting the data and you can see the PCM data coming out on the scope do you want to have a look I suppose you do don't you hold on a minute let's just do that hold on it's easier just to show it isn't it so let's just get this set up now I'll press that and now video lock lock the video or lock the focus focus you focusing 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 I want you to focus every day. A little bit brighter and focus. Come on, focus. Jesus wept. That's it. That's it. Now she's locked, babies, boys and girls. Right, okay, so I'm going to run you over the AKM5384 chip. Um, turn the music down. Down, down, down because you won't be able to hear me otherwise. But you need to see it working with some music coming in. So, power on. Get the scope probe, wherever that's gone, there it is. And will we get some music? This is the question. All right, so we've got a little bit of low volume music. And I can turn up and down here with the input. Okay, so look. Um, what we're looking for, this is AKM5381, pin 11 is the master clock. Should be going around about the right frequency to give you a, there it is. So you can see it's 25 megahertz or thereabouts. Ignore what the scope says, it's not particularly accurate. The frequency counts is a good indication. Then we've got the master clock pin for the PCM data. Postcode modulation, let's slow that down. There it is. So you see she's running at 48 kilohertz, which sounds like familiar for a PCM uh, sample frequency, doesn't it? So that's all right. And then we go to the actual serial data pins. We know it's working anyway, so you can hear the music. So this is what it should look like. And when it was doing its horrible buzzing thing, it was doing this as well, all right? Now you can see the PCM data coming. You won't be able to see what it is. It's all varying depending on what Bono is singing at the moment. But you can see there's 16-bit PCM data, right? Noughts and ones. That's the numbers represent the analog levels on left and right. They're piped into the same channel. 
And then the other critical voltage on this chip, uh, which I find often goes, is the um, so, uh, analog reference voltage pin. Which one's that? Bias voltage AD, yeah, yeah, okay, pin four, okay, pin four is the analog supply voltage divided by two, and if that's not there on this chip, then it's blown, because that's when I usually just look at that voltage and see that it's not there. There you go, and we've got 2.48 volts. Yeah, so 5381's working fine, and to recap, changing this crystal has made it much more stable. I can listen to it as long as I want, as long as I don't touch the remote control. As soon as I touch the remote control, so as soon as I touch the remote control, it goes. Right, let's turn that off. So that is new behaviour and changing one crystal has made it a lot more stable. Um, which is odd in itself really because we saw the stability of the crystals but bear in mind you only need a glitch or a bit of noise or some sort of instability to um, screw things up. All right. Um, Usually with these DSPs they don't start up properly because the input voltages, they've got dual supply rail, usually 1.7 and 3.3. Um, and sometimes they have a 0.7 in the core as well, but um, if the voltages don't come up relative to each other in the right order uh, and with relative to the um, reset chip, then you get this problem where they won't start up properly. But this is starting up. so. I'm just going to bite the bullet and go and change that second crystal. I'm not going to bother you showing you me doing it, but I'm going to try that sec second crystal and see if that makes any difference at all. Just out of curiosity now, because we know the input D2A, um, A to D is working. I was, next I was going to scope out, I believe the PCM1606E is the, uh, that one there is the output chip. So. I'm going to change the crystal first because this has made a difference and then I'm going to check, get the data sheet down for that and check that this is actually, if this is receiving PCM data and the PCM clock looks good and we're still getting horrible noises coming out of it, then it's either going to be this chip or the amplifier. So that's the next step to change. But I'm going to do the crystal first. So back in a moment. Just won't be long for you though. Lots of swearing for me. Right, 26 meg megahertz crystal has been changed. Now soldering those crystals on the board does warm things up slightly, so we have to be careful we don't think. If this works, we're thinking, oh, we fixed it, blah, 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 but actually it might be the heat, so if it works, we'll have it cool down, run it again, and then fine. And if it starts playing up, we'll then put some heat on the processor, okay, with the hot air gun, and see whether that causes it reinduces the fault, because let's move that out of the way. I'm a bloody useless cameraman, aren't I? So power on, contact, I don't want any copyright strikes, that's going to be a quick piece of music. Right, so she's powered up. Right, she's playing. Let's turn her up a bit. Oh, I've never been able to do that before. The question is, is she reliable? She's much more safe than she's not reliable, yeah? Well, what do you think? Never done that before, not with this board. Could it be that simple? Could it? Interesting, we couldn't see the aberrations or the perturbations that were happening in the clock, but you can't, you know, it's going so fast. It only needs to miss a couple of beats or a cycles or a bit of noise upsets it. And to catch that on scope, I was not say on camera, but on scope is quite hard, but my gut feeling is that might be fixed, but in a moment it's going to start howling at me and prove me wrong. So before I, before I get a copyright strike from YouTube, I should get some copyright free music, shouldn't I? Um, it's still working. That looks like that's fixed to me. Interesting. One crystal improved it so I could listen to music and the second crystal improved it so I could turn the music up and down. Or the volume, should I say. It seems weird, doesn't it? But it isn't really if you think if the time isn't right and the clocks aren't correct, then the whole thing is going to go skewy. Right, sit rep update. It's still failing, but it is vastly more reliable. Vastly more reliable, which is strange. 
So clearly the processor is not happy. The fact when it fails you can't shut it down, it doesn't mean it. Clearly the processor is crashing. But that could be just very poor, bad error management in the code. You know, one bit comes back wrongly. Relative pointer or something, it branches off, goes up its own exhaust pipe, end of story. But it's vastly more stable. Much more stable. Half an hour is working up and down, thought it fixed it, then suddenly the old whistle came back again. Now, I was poking around with this um, PCM1606 E, um, that's a hex uh, D2A, and that's there's four audio channels coming out of this thing, I think, and this turns the bitstream from the processor into the audio. And when you turn the volume up and down, it crashes. So I'm wondering at the moment is it's obviously accessing, and the data sheet says uh, no. So there isn't <coughs> there isn't any volume control or attenuation in there. It's just numbers in, analog out on six channels. Okay, so there's a complicated bitstream coming in on three data pins and a main clock. What's LRCK? There's a B clock, and I'll show you this diagram. B clock, LRCK, LRCK. Left and right clock input. Right, OK. Uh, so the clocks are all divided in the main processor, or the DSP, and then it clocks that thing. Now, I was poking around on it, and I was probing the pins, and it stopped working, OK? I thought, that's a bit strange. I've killed it. I well, thought I was being quite careful, but poking around on this chip here I'm talking about, the 1606, and uh, it thought it would kill it. So then I warmed it up with the hot air gun, and it's been working ever since. What does that mean? Is it a coincidence? Is it a dry joint? Is it a bad bonding wire? Or a fracture inside the actual device itself. At the moment it's looking suspect. The problem is I don't have any stock of those and the only UK stockist that's got them has got an MOQ order for 30 quid for free shipping otherwise eight pound shipping. So about five pounds or for the chip itself. So I think I'm just gonna um, flux that and reflow it at the moment and see whether that fixes the problem and run it for a while. Um, clearly, one thing that puts me off the fact that it might not be that chip is that it only has inputs, right? It doesn't have any outputs to the processor, so in theory the processor is just blasting stuff out on pins and that's just receiving it and turning it into audio. Yeah, so I doubt the processor is actually writing anything apart from data to that in real time. So unless there's a load on a data pin which is upsetting the processor, could be loading the core. It's tricky, but it's I mean, it's almost reliable. Now it's at the stage now where if you weren't exhaustively testing it, you would just send it back thinking you fixed it just by changing those two crystals, right? But it's not quite right still. Not quite right. Not quite right. So onwards and upwards. That one there is to do with the HDMI input. It could be a problem. Sometimes the when you switch it on, it doesn't start up properly either, and that's an indication that something's not quite right. It might turn out just to be the DSP is just gone, or faulty, or a dodgy memory location. But I don't think it will be referring to the flash once it's booted. There's just not enough function in there to worry about it going back to access the flash when you hit the volume control. Because at the moment it's only failing when you hit the volume control in fact, the last time I ran it, I couldn't get it to fail at all, so it's a lot more reliable than it was. And I'd say the last thing I did was to heat this chip up. Interesting. If I had one, I would change that right now, uh, just to rule that chip out for the four or five pounds it's going to save time. I have um, probed the pins and the signals look correct, but then it's working, so I can't see any loaded or um, odd-shaped or rounded edges on the timing signals. The signals look clean. So we haven't got a damaged input or a slightly faulty output from the processor which is not driving the edges cleanly. So it comes back to something crashing the processor. As I say, I warmed this up and it worked. It's been working ever since, so maybe there's a faulty connection on that. Difficult to know, but that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reflow that and then we'll see it goes from there. So I'll just quickly do that. Mm. 
Right, set wrap. Resoldered the dastardly device. You can see that. There she blows. I'll just uh, zoom in on that for you. Right, there's the offending device. What, 606? You can see I've refloated it. I just went along it. I put some of the old um, flux drill up in it, but I didn't. I know I've repeated this, but the, the um, BGA flux, the Kingbo flux, I, I use it in a syringe. This thing here is fantastic. You just go along with your solid iron and just reflow the pins. And I did that about an hour ago, and this is royalty free music. Bloody awful, but at least it tells it's working. And it's been working ever since. I haven't actually made it fail yet. So I turn it up and down. Right, at this point of the repair investigation, it's often useful to, to stop and take stock and just look at the design. And um, we've established that the quality of the clocks makes a big impact on the reliability because we changed the crystals. And when we changed the first crystal, we had an improvement. We changed the second crystal, we had a further improvement. Um, we proved that codecs are working okay. So maybe it might be time to have a look at the power uh, of the unit, the, the DC voltage rails, and whether the filtering is adequate. I've seen a lot of processor systems where by you get a slightly marginal processor. Bear in mind these are made over a period of years and the electrical characteristics of the processor vary slightly. And it's like with over overclocking processors in equipment. They they can they will run faster, they can run better, but they're not specified to do so. They're not supported by the manufacturer because there is a wide wide range of characteristics which they need to make sure that the data sheet gives a reliable view, a realistic view or account of what the uh, device can stand and the voltage levels and the thresholds and the amount of noise and what have you so that the the worst ones are 100% reliable. There's an error theory where there are bit errors you have to have very 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 high confidence in the switching and the um, transition levels and the timing to give you absolutely error-free operations that's why there's parity checks and things on most processors okay but this could just be a processor which is slightly on the bottom edge of the parameters of uh, Texas Instruments that made it and it might be sensitive and I've seen this many times where you know it seems to be an adequate design but on some they just need that bit of extra and of course the design engineer designed this back way back when they had probably 20 or 100 samples from Texas and they worked okay of course, Texas aren't going to supply marginal samples, are they? So, as a designer, it's difficult. So, there does seem to be a lot of decoupling. Can you see all these capacitors down here? All these ones around here? That's a row of uh, 0603 or 0402 decoupling capacitors for the pins. So, there is filtration. But the thing that makes me think it might be power is that quite often it's induced to fail when you press the remote control. Okay. So there's a gulp of power being taken by the remote control chip and the interface to um, to transmit the data. It's only a tiny amount, but if you've got something that's running at 60 megahertz, you've only got to get a little glitch which coincides with a, a digital signal or a timing edge, and the edge goes wrong, and the software or the firmware hasn't got any error correction or recovery or a watchdog, and it can crash. And clearly this has got no watchdog, otherwise it would reset itself without the beep, wouldn't it? And you just have a small pause in the audio if the watchdog works. So obviously there doesn't seem to be one enabled. So at the moment I'm thinking obviously the HF uh, decoupling looks good. We've got these X7R capacitors here on this power supply rail and then if I turn, this is another unit, this is another non-functional unit I've got to repair. But if we look at the top surface of the original unit we've been working on, you've just got uh, some pretty naff actually electrolytics down here I don't know whether they're particularly good ones or not on the ESR because it's almost impossible to find out what the part number of this component is. But what I think I'm going to do is initially swap these out for some high quality ones and maybe this is the X7R, it's quite good at uh, high frequency decoupling but won't be able to supply gulps of power because the capacitance will be too low. So. What we could try at the moment is just adding some capacitance across these two components here. 
and possibly this one down here to fix the problem. I would normally fit the Panasonic tin capacitors with the low effective series resistance which we mentioned earlier because they are much much better and you can prove by, that they work better by causing a transient and just seeing how well the capacitor supports the supply rail during a, a transient uh, uh, over voltage or under voltage just a noise spike basically. Let's just try that and see whether it sorts the problem or not. As I said before there's very little on this thing really not much there at all. It's marginal it could be power. It could be power if they haven't done the design correctly and uh, there's not a great track history <laughs> track record actually of good power supplies in this um, equipment range if you know what I mean. So let's have a look at the power next. We've improved it vastly but it's still not reliable. Okay. So let's uh, let's put those um, let's put those components on. I'll strap them across temporarily because otherwise I have to go to the office and get the stuff from the Panasonic parts from the drawer. So I'm gonna have I got some? Yeah, I've got some Fujicon 100 microfarad capacitors. I think I like they're Rubicons, so even better. So they're Rubicons 2500s, and let's see where we go from there. Ah, oh, we're cooking on gas now. <laughs> yeah. Cheese fix! <laughs> it's been a slog, I tell you. But I'm gonna put this one out there for you guys, anybody that wants it. I'll turn the music off now. Perseverance always pays off. I don't know who Perseverance was, but he was a useful fella. Anyway, let's have a slip of coffee. Celebratory coffee, look, I've been holding back. Yeah, so, um, it did fail. At the end of the last video, it was working for a while, and then suddenly the of death have happened, and um, so I changed the codec chip, and it's made no difference whatsoever. Look, here's the old one. There she blows. There's the old fella. Just there. Didn't make any difference at all. But everything was so marginal. So marginal. You think, this isn't a happy processor, okay? I mean, I've repaired, I've literally repaired, no exaggeration, 2,000 Bose products, I suppose. And I'm not exaggerating, over the last 10 years. If you think about it, it's only 200 a year, four a week. Is that right? Anyway. Yeah, and I, I've only ever seen, I bought the um, a bunch of Texas DSP chips because when I was originally going about fixing these things I didn't have any circuit diagrams I, I, can, I figured it was the DSP but I was wrong after changing a few I always found it was something else not the DSP itself okay um, and having fixed that many everything's got a DSP in it apart from the very old stuff from Bose and uh, it's either the clocks the um, timing of the circuit or power right? and in this case it seems to be lack of decoupling around the actual device the DSP itself it was running much better with the new crystals okay so the crystals are running for the power supply the power supply needs decoupling less noise on the clocks so changing the crystals improved things somewhat and then warming the uh, board up also improved things somewhat okay so something funny going on so in the end I thought I can't see what's going on so I could see some noise on the 1.7 volt rail so I got um, three pretty decent um, they're not the best you know cutting edge but they're not really the best ones for decoupling but the 1.7 and 3.3 volt rail I've added some decoupling 100 microfarads on each to test it and yeah she's been running all day up and down. Now it's fixed this one. This one is definitely fixed now. Um, but whether it will fix yours I don't know. But what we did, I'm just going to zoom in and show you what, what's been done. Right. Cause of instability, boys. Cause of instability, the clocks. So I changed two clock crystals. I've got some of these. If you want to buy some off me, I have to buy an MOQ minimum order quantity. So 
let me know. I'll post you one or two. Um, and then across these three supplies, you can see I've put 100 microfarads. That's the negative. Positive, that's 100 mic. I'm not going to leave these in. I'm going to get some better ones than that. I'll probably put some tantalums in, actually. Some very low ESR capacitors. I've got some really good ones. Um, are they here or are they at the office? I've got some Panasonic low ESR capacitors anyway, and the effective series resistance means if you did an equivalent circuit of a perfect capacitor and then you put a resistor in series with it, the ESR is the effective series resistance, okay? I mean, it is frequency dependent, but what it means is either it's a very, very good capacitor, and if you imagine a capacitor with a resistor in series with it, it's not so good, because if you take a big gulp of sharp gulp of power from it then you're going to develop a voltage across that resistor and the voltage across the capacitor will drop even though it's not due to the reduction in charge in the, on the plates of the capacitor. So imagine a capacitor with a resistor in series and how that would um, react to a transient response or a fast edge then you can get quite high currents and when quite high currents across a resistance you get quite high voltages or proportional voltages and in this case we don't want the voltage drop, we want that voltage to be very low impedance that the supply to the processor. The lower in the impedance of the supply, i.e. Uh, the equivalent series resistance of the supply if you like, the less noise you will get, okay? So by increasing the decoupling we stabilize the processor. Now whether this is a particularly bad one or not I don't know. Uh, sample size of one, but if you get this, I've heard this humming problem from a lot of people the processor crashing if if um, you change the crystals first put these capacitors in it will probably stabilize it it stabilize this one I've heated it up I've cooled it down I've been using it for about half a day it's absolutely rock solid at the moment whereas before you know everything I did improved it slightly uh, but this is the final fix I think so I'm going to put some decent low ESR, ESR capacitors in there um, and then put it back together and bolt it up and send it back to the YouTube viewer and hopefully that will solve his problem but there it is um, hope you enjoyed watching that it was a bit of a voyage it's taken me I reckon all, all in all I think probably about four hours on this but if I can spend four hours and say and save 400 from the skip I consider that my time well spent so boys get your soldering irons out give it a go and let me know if you've got the same fault and whether it fixes it or not and then we can build on this and get these things back into a service rather than into the landfill hope you enjoyed watching it go down the corner of the screen down there so my finger is there's a, a subscribe button hit the subscribe button it gives me a thrill uh, massages my vanity whatever you want to call it but there it is uh, oh yeah and there's one down here as well don't forget that cap down there across that 1.7 volt supply all right so three caps, two crystals, pounds worth of components. And she's fixed. She's fixed. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed that anyway. Take care.